Well, welcome everyone to the uh, second webinar, hemp webinar in our series. Um, and today we're going to be talking about getting the season started. What are some of um, the considerations out in the field at this moment? I imagine most people are actually out in the field today. <laughs> it's a beautiful day out and probably planting and, and getting the fields ready. So we are recording this and we'll put it up online to share and for folks to share with others. I know a, a number of farmers have emailed saying they haven't been able to make the webinars because it's been such great uh, weather in the field. So um, we will be posting these. Um, Susie, would you like to talk a little bit about our our risk management project before we get into the webinar sure. today? So in this project, we're um, focusing on education, particularly education about hemp recently being a crop that we can all grow legally. So we're covering all areas of risk. Last week, we had a webinar on the Vermont new hemp rule. So if anyone missed that webinar, it is in recorded format on the UVM Extension website. This week, it's all about growing and production and irrigation. Then we have a couple more later in the month on disease on the 30th and then August, sorry, disease and pests. One is July the 9th, the pest one, then July the 30th, the disease. And then towards the end of the summer, we have two more that return to the legal aspects having to do with hemp sampling and testing. Um, but I just wanna take this opportunity to one, thank the project team, Kat, Catherine, Heather, myself, Susie Hodgson, and John, who's here to us, with us today. And also to thank our sponsors, the Northeast Extension Risk Management Education made these webinars possible, where we can pull all this information together. So in this webinar, we're gonna try and answer most of your questions at the end of the presentation. But if we can't, we can capture all the questions and our aim is to provide guidance later in the season. So everything will be available to you in some shape or form as we go throughout the season. So over to you, Heather. Great. And Thanks, John? Susie. Yeah, I want to introduce John Bruce, who's also on the call today. John has really been heading up the field research that we're doing on hemp and um, asked him to participate and jump in where he felt appropriate. Um, but again, as Susie mentioned today, we're going to really just be talking about things that people should be considering at this point. Obviously, folks are in um, in the field and um, are already planting. Sorry, I'm trying to share my screen and I'm sharing the wrong wrong thing. <laughs> so it's a little bit late to um, be thinking about. There we go. You know the planning aspect. And really now we're in real time, so we have to just be thinking about um, some of the aspects in the field right now that you're still going to have a little bit of control over, you know, as far as variety selection goes, um, you know, hopefully <laughs> you've already made that decision as far as getting plants started and securing plants for the season, all of that work has already been done. And now we're headed out in, into the field, trying to get the crop into the ground and thinking about um, some of the considerations there. So uh, we've been growing hemp for a few years now at UVM and it's certainly not to say that um, we are the experts. I think we're learning just like everyone else um, and trying to learn at a rapid pace so that we can you know, help others um, that are trying to grow hemp. And really this is just to, to show um, the weather trends that we've been growing in over the last few years. And you can see 2019, which is right here, was below average in temperature and then kind of average in temperature for most of the season. 2018 was way above average as far as temperature goes, and 2017, for the most part, was below average. And in all of these years that were extremely different, we have been able to bring in a, a really great high-yielding hemp crop. And this year is posing you know, very different challenges, just like every year does. 
Um, no year is the same. Right now, it across most of Vermont, we're in um, very dry conditions. It actually has been relatively cool, I guess, except for these uh, <laughs> last few days. Now we're into a 90 degree uh, heat wave. But overall, the season has been dry and a little bit on the cool side. And again, very different from last year, if you were growing last year, which was cold and wet. So I think we're off to a little bit of a better start this year. And most people hopefully um, have their plants in the ground or are getting them in the ground as we speak, because conditions are good. Uh, one thing I wanna start with, which I have uh, noticed a little bit across the landscape, is that uh, people are growing hemp where they grew it last year or even the year before. And I wanted to start with this slide instead of ending with it because although you can't change where you just planted the hemp this year or probably where you're gonna plant it, but right now is actually the time to start thinking about where am I gonna plant the hemp next year? And I'm, again, noticing already this sort of movement into poor, what I would consider poor rotation. So what is crop rotation? It means um, rotating the crops from one crop type to another that's grown in the same field. So as an example, most of the rotations we see on the Vermont landscape are corn into hay. If you um, are on a vegetable farm, it may be tomatoes into pumpkins, right? So the crops are being rotated, hopefully into a different crop and also into a different plant family. Why do we use crop rotations? We use crop rotations to eliminate diseases, reduce weed pressure, um, capitalize on, on the rotation, so benefits that one crop may provide to another. But I would say primarily one of the number one reasons to rotate your crop is to minimize the buildup of devastating diseases. And hemp is a plant that is susceptible to so many diseases um, and many of those diseases build up in the soil year after year. So if last year you had, you know, some plants that had white mold, well, that white mold now is gonna go from a few plants to likely many plants because the disease itself is spreading through the soil. And then if you choose to grow hemp a third year, that disease will continue to get worse and to build up. Um, the rec my recommendation and also recommendations from other regions is that hemp should be rotated ideally to a new spot, a new field every year. Um, two years really should be the maximum that you keep hemp in production in any one field. Otherwise, you're going to continue to see um, likely yield declines for each year you keep that hemp in the field. Um, and again, as the disease builds up, especially diseases like white mold, you will, you know, at some point not be able to grow um, a crop there at all. So to minimize disease buildup, you know, really you should not return to that same field for about four years. Now, many people didn't plan for rotation when they started their hemp businesses. So, you know, if you bought 10 acres of land to grow 10 acres of hemp, um, you weren't planning for crop rotation. Because ideally, to grow 10 acres of hemp, really you should have about 40 acres of land to be able to rotate um every year or every couple of years okay so now this disease in particular is one that will build up quickly and can be very very devastating to hemp it's white mold i already mentioned it it's sclerotinia sclerotium and white mold is problematic in hundreds of plant 
um, species. So any plant that you're growing that's a broad leaf, so not a grass, um, will likely be susceptible to white mold. So if you're rotating from hemp to beans, not a good rotation because beans are also very susceptible to white mold. Rotating from hemp really to some type of grass would be more ideal. Um, so again, once this white mold builds up in the field and it builds up by producing these little black rocks, which is the overwintering body, um, these black rocks can survive in the soil six years, 10 years. So again, once you have a lot of them from not rotating the crop, it is very difficult to grow a high yielding healthy crop, okay? All right, so um, again, soil limitations, I've talked about these year after year after year with folks. And again, you, you have what you have, right? You bought a farm, you own a farm, it's heavy clay soil or it's um, sandy soil. You know, you're gonna try to grow the best crop for that soil type. But hemp itself um, does not like waterlogged soils. And I think a lot of people found that out last year, trying to grow hemp when it was very wet. Um, and so if you have soils that are somewhat poorly drained, you really need to be thinking about ways to increase the drainage so that you have a better crop. And that can be in the form of, you know, even using just raised beds that a lot of people are using today to help drain that soil a little bit better. But again, you know, your best, most productive hemp will be on those soils that are 40% uh, or less clay and have really um, good drainage. Here's just a picture of some water stressed hemp. So let's talk a little bit about fertility. Many of you may have already added fertility to the soil, um, which is good if you're planting and you needed uh, potassium or phosphorus and nitrogen and lime, all of that um, should be added prior to planting, depending on the fertility source that you're using. And again, just to reiterate, hemp is, um, uses a large amount of nitrogen, a large amount of potassium, and a smaller amount of phosphorus. Hemp also uses many micronutrients. And again, if you have a soil that is very depleted, uh, you need to make sure these nutrients get added before you plant. So let's take a quick look at the soil test. Um, and again, I just want you hopefully to have one of these. <laughs> so hopefully you took a soil test well before you were going to plant. Um, if you didn't, you know, there's still opportunity to add nutrients. Um, and really the best way to grow crops is to know what's in your soil to start with, okay? Because you don't wanna throw away uh, money by buying unneeded fertilizer. You don't wanna add fertilizer to the field that the crop doesn't need um, because an imbalance itself can cause issues with disease, pests, um, productivity issues in the plant. So here is a soil test that I just wanna go through quickly and identify uh, if this was my field, what I would do at this point. So you can see this field is low in phosphorus low in potassium. And also, if you look down here at the soil pH, you can see that it is very low on the pH scale, right? So as far as pH goes, which is the acidity of the soil, you want the pH to be over six, okay? So a pH of 5.8 um, needs to be modified. You need to get the pH of the soil up over six. Okay, um, the phosphorus here is low and so isn't the potassium. And what this means is that if you don't add these nutrients, it is highly likely that the plant itself will be lower in yield, 
will show some type of nutrient set stress, again, by not yielding as much, not growing as tall or as vigorous or having as many flower buds or seeds. So these kind of nutrient deficiencies need to be fixed, okay? So you want your soil test levels to be in the optimum range. If you get a soil test back and it says optimum phosphorus, optimum potassium, optimum pH, optimum magnesium, then really you don't likely need to add much um, of those nutrients to the soil, all right? But in this case, there is a lot that needs to be done here. Now, phosphorus and potassium needed in these quantities, so this is 100 pounds of phosphorus and 140 pounds of potash or potassium, this needs to be added pre-plant. These quantities of fertilizer really should not be added later in the season because it's going to impact the overall yield and quality of the crop if you don't have them on the field early enough, okay? So these quantities, again, really needed to be added before you put those uh, plants in the ground. The lime, so limestone, it says here, um, needs to be added also, really, before you plant the crop. And why is that? Because lime takes time to react in the soil, okay? So you want a little bit of time for the lime to react and to adjust the pH. And in this case, you can see if you add a ton and a half of lime, you can raise the pH to 6.2. All right, so taking a soil test is really important. In this case, if you went out and you, you know, added uh, like a ton of compost, let's say, a ton of compost is not going to meet the nutrient needs of that crop. Um, and you'll be disappointed at the end. You'll say, why didn't my crop perform well? And likely it's because you didn't really give it what it needed. And it's really hard to tell what a crop is going to need if you don't take a soil test. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with soil testing, um, you can find more information on our website. Maybe Catherine can type that into the chat box for us. Um, there's lots of information on how to properly take a test and where to send it. Um, we don't really have time to talk about that today. And again, you can reach out to myself or John um, or Catherine to get that information. Now, your soil test also lists these micronutrients, iron, manganese, boron, copper, zinc, um, sodium, aluminum. Uh, and we generally say that micronutrients aren't commonly deficient in the Northeast. Um, micronutrients that we do see deficiencies of include boron and zinc. And in some rare cases, we also see deficiencies of manganese um, and other micronutrients not listed on this test. Where do we see micronutrient deficiencies? We see those types of deficiencies on soils that are very light textured, okay? So soils that are very sandy and do not have a his history of organic matter amendments. So what is an organic matter amendment? Cow manure, compost, um, other livestock manures, okay? So if you're growing on a dairy farm that's had a lot of manure amendment, likely you're not gonna see much in the way of micronutrient deficiencies, okay? Um, but if you're on a, a very sandy soil that has not been grown on for many, many years and has not been maintained, I would highly advise that you apply a micronutrient package um, suitable for uh, a broad range of micronutrients to those fields. 
Um, and again, each soil test is really different and we're here to help you interpret those. We have lots of resources, both online and people resources. So John, who's on the call, Catherine, Scott Lewins is also on the call. Um, just call our office, usually our number is listed here, and we'll help walk you through it and try to better understand um, you know, what kind of recommendations and uh, amendments you should be using to grow the best crop of hemp. Okay, so let me see here. We have done some research looking at um, nitrogen rates because again, that is the nutrient um, that hemp needs a lot of. It also tends to be very limiting in most agricultural soils. So it is a nutrient that many people add, most people add on a yearly basis whether it's in the form of you know, some type of manure or compost or purchased fertilizer. So really understanding what rate of application um, provides the highest yields and quality of hemp is very critical. So we have been evaluating nitrogen rates. Um, we only have one year of data and John is actually conducting this experiment again this year. But what I want you to notice here is that we, we see maximum uptake, which means how much the plant is gonna take out of the soil, when we apply 125 pounds of nitrogen per acre. More than that rate, um, or really even less than that rate, um, did not maximize uptake in the plant, okay? So right now, um, prelimi preliminarily, we would recommend a nitrogen rate of 125 pounds of N nitrogen per acre. Now again, how you add that nitrogen and when is really important as well. So just because I just told you, you need 125 pounds of nitrogen, doesn't mean you should go out and dump all of that on the plants today because you planted them already and, and you just learned this information, okay? The nitrogen really should be administered to the plants slowly um, over the vegetative period, okay? So you don't wanna dump it on all at once. Um, that's risky environmentally and you'll likely lose much of the nitrogen um, from environmental loss before the plant has time to take it up. So slowly applying the nutrients or um, applying slow release nutrients, such as in the form of manure or compost, um, is a better way to approach adding the nitrogen. Okay, so you can see when we applied 125 pounds of nitrogen, we maximized the yields um, and we didn't impact negatively the THC levels. So the total THC is here. Okay, so some people say, oh, if you apply too much nitrogen, you'll see spikes in THC. We, we did not see that. And really we didn't see much change in the CBD content as well. These numbers are listed but they were not statistically different amongst the rates, which means that theoretically there was no difference, okay? So again, if you need help with fertility, please feel, re um, please feel free to reach out because again, there's a lot to making really good recommendations, more than what we can cover today in a 30 minute webinar. Um, another question that I've been asked frequently lately is about plant spacing. Again, most people are planting at uh, five by five um, plant schematic where the plants are five feet in the row and between rows. This is very common to maximize you know, plant size. But we do have many people that are moving to autoflower varieties that are planted closer together 
Auto flower varieties are generally one to two feet apart because they grow much smaller um, and, to, and over a shorter period of time. So to maximize yield, um, <clears throat> they need to be planted closer together. So again, generally most people are at five by five still, which is perfectly fine. Good for airflow, reducing disease, maximizing per plant yield. Um, but as we move into planting with uh, equip, um, planting by seed and planting auto flower varieties, the plant, uh, plant spacing is being reduced. Okay. All right, so there are some benefits to a, a smaller plant spacing, which in this one by one um, plant schematic, you can see the per acre yield is much higher than when we're planting in a five by five planting schematic. And again, there's many more plants out in the field. Each plant yields less but because there's more plants per acre, the amount of yield goes up on a per acre basis. The decision on plant spacing really has to take into account your market, the type of variety that you're growing, um, the type of harvest equipment that you have, uh, the, type, the level of disease pressure, and you know the variety that you're growing. So I can't really say definitively that everybody should be planting, you know, five feet apart or three feet apart or one foot apart. It really depends on a number of factors. But I will say that hemp can be grown su successfully um, with many different plant spacings. So really, ultimately, it has to do with um, some of the factors I was talking about, you know, your market and the type of equipment you have and disease pressure. Okay. I'm going to skip ahead here. This is just showing you that the per plant yield is higher, as I just mentioned, when you plant this um, individual plants further apart. Okay. Um, but when you have one by one spacing, the amount of yield that each plant has is pretty low, but there's more plants. So ultimately, if you have acres and acres and acres, you'll have more yield. All right. One of the issues that we have noticed with the tighter plant spacing, as I mentioned before, is more powdery mildew, especially in the Northeast where we have um, tend to have wet conditions, humid conditions, and really we need those plants drying out <laughs> daily so that it limits the spread of disease or the onset of disease. So one of the limitations we have here, of course, is our temperate climate. Um, and so growing varieties with known disease resistance to powdery mildew um, in particular, and also gray mold, um, is really important, especially as you start to pack those plants together. The other thing I'll mention quickly is powdery mildew, certainly, um, you know, there's varietal tolerances that we see, but it's also influenced by nitrogen. So if you're over applying nitrogen, you will likely have more problems with powdery mildew than, um, if you're applying at adequate rates. All right, so planning date, here we are. Let's see, we're right here, 17th of June. I guess it's the 18th of June. You can see ideally planting a bit earlier. So planting last week um, for us anyway has really produced uh, much higher yields compared to waiting into mid or even late June. However, planting into late June, as many people know, um, will still produce a decent crop of hemp, but um, the potential CBD and other cannabidiols may actually decline as the planting dates are delayed. 
And you know, that should make sense to you because it just means there's less time for those plants to develop, uh, especially as we get into fall and we see the increase in the cannab cannabidiols and other terpenes um, as we move into the plants maturing. So if they have less time to mature, then they're naturally gonna have lower rates. So getting those plants in the ground a bit earlier will maximize yields and quality. All right, so just quickly on grain and fiber, because we do have many people moving into um, this type of production. Planning for grain and fiber really follows that same schematic as for CBD or planting for flour. Really, you want to plant when um, the soil conditions are prime. So this was data from, I think, 2016. And you can see we saw the highest yields by planting at the end of May. And then we actually saw yield declines by waiting into June, OK? but in the following year, we saw the highest yields when we planted into June, okay? So planting hemp into the ground as seed is really tricky. You want to make sure that the soil conditions are optimum, so there's a little bit of moisture in the ground, um, and that we're headed into a warm um, stretch of weather that um, doesn't have any torrential rainfalls projected. <laughs> so I guess you get out your crystal ball to figure that out. But really the take home message is, we have some flexibility in the planning date of hemp. There are some trade-offs, of course, but you just really wanna get the hemp in the ground when the conditions are optimum, if you can, and that can be at the end of May, well into, um, the end of June. So we do have, you know, some time that we don't always have with some of our other crops. All right, quickly on water requirements. So I think everybody knows that um, hemp does require water. It can be very drought resistant, but that also means that you have to have a deep soil. Um, you need to have a deep tap root. <laughs> so really good soil conditions. Um, and you can definitely have hemp that ends up being very drought tolerant once it's established, okay? So, you know, hemp that is small um, and just in the ground does need a decent amount of water so that it can get established and growing. Across the growing um, season, hemp uses as much water, you know, as hops or corn, about 20 to 30 inches of rainfall across the entire growing season, okay? But most of the water absorption, just like all of our other crops, occurs um, basically from the time the hemp is about knee high um, until about the time that flowering begins. So essentially it's first six to eight weeks of growth. So we do see a benefit from irrigating. Um, and we do see increased yields, but I, I want to say it should be mindful irrigation. You actually should be thinking about how much water you're adding. Here's an example of a crop that was just, you know, overwatered. Uh, it brought in more disease. This crop has white mold right now and it's dying basically um, because it has rotted off at, at the base of the soil. So we want you to irrigate, but we want you to think about um, how much water you should be adding on a weekly basis. So I'm gonna give you a few tips here, um, and this is on our website, and we can um, maybe do a blog post on this so everybody has it handy. But these are evapotranspiration rates, and this is from Burlington, Vermont. So basically this is how much water is being um, moved you know, from the ground up into the air based on heat. So you can see that evapotranspiration in January is pretty minimal. And in Burlington, it's the highest in July, right? So this makes sense. It's when it's the hottest and, and sunniest. So we have a lot of water evaporating from the ground into the air. So this is when your water demand um, for your crop is gonna be the highest as well. Right? So over time, when you plant in May and June, 
The crop needs some water, but not as much as it will need in July um, and into August. So we use these evapotranspiration rates to actually figure out how many, how much water your plants are gonna need. Now you can do this very scientifically <laughs> and you can measure evapotranspiration and figure out how much water you're losing on a daily basis, a weekly basis, um, and figure out how much water you need to be putting back on the ground. But I'm just gonna give you the quick and dirty. So let's start here, we're in June right now. And roughly your plant, one hemp plant needs about 18 and a half gallons of water each week, one plant, right? So you can extrapolate this out to however many plants you have. So if this week we didn't get any rainfall, then you should be giving your plant 18 and a half gallons of water each plant, okay, to have enough water to um, grow properly. Now, if we get an inch of rain, you're gonna wanna subtract that off of the amount that you would give that crop, okay? So I did a little example down here, and this is for July. So you need 19.79 gallons of water per plant every week. Um, we get an inch of rain, okay? And we multiply that by the number of gallons of water there are in an inch of rain, which is 27,000, times the acreage of hemp, okay? So in this case, I'm only watering one plant. And then it calculates how many gallons I need to give to that plant minus the rainfall, all right? So if I got an inch of rain, now my plant only needs four gallons. So you don't have to water as much that week, all right? So again, this is just a quick and dirty um, because I know a lot of people have questions about like, how long do I run this irrigation for? How many gallons of water should I be giving these plants? This again is just, you know, a little bit of quick math to help you feel better about what you're giving those plants. Now, as you can imagine, you know, these next three, four days, there's going to be a really high rate of evapotranspiration. And what we're seeing leaving the ground is far greater than, than normal. And so those plants are going to need some extra water. All right. Okay. So I'm already running out of time. Whoa, way out of time. Uh, and I'm almost done anyway. So we are getting a lot of questions about cover cropping and what to grow between the hemp rows. So the hemp's in the ground, now what do I do? Well, there are lots of different cover crops available and people get really excited about some of the fancy mixes they see out there. I get emails about, oh, should I be growing sun hemp or cowpeas or sunflower or buckwheat? Um, so a couple of rules of thumb. You don't wanna plant anything that is going to really impede airflow, right? So you don't wanna plant a cover crop that's gonna get really big um, and block the flow of air um, and keep your hemp plants from drying out. Um, and especially if you can't really get in there and mow very often, <laughs> you don't want something that's gonna tower over your plants um, and cause other issues. So, you know, you wanna really ideally have a cover crop that is relatively low growing um, and is not going to compete that much with the hemp and also not contribute to more disease buildup. So one of the cover crop mixtures that I've been using and I'm very fond of at this point is an annual rye grass um, and crimson clover or white clover mixture. So annual ryegrass is relatively low growing. It establishes quickly. It can be mowed often. It doesn't get too tall and it suppresses weeds. So in hemp, I think it is um, a, good, a good option. Um, and here's a picture of our cover crop last year between our hemp rows. 
Um, here's another example up here on the top. And I will say that John Bruce and I again and Sunset View Farm are conducting a study on different cover crop types um, to see, you know, get a better sense of, of maybe what we should be putting out there. As far as a rate goes, um, anywhere from 20 to 30 pounds per acre is good. Um, you can broadcast annual ryegrass and clover pretty easily and it will take, um, but obviously getting it worked in or at least broadcasted it onto, um, I wanna say friable ground uh, is important for quick establishment, all right? And lastly, I'll end on corn borer. You should be thinking about this now. Um, you should, this was a huge issue last year, not to say it will be this year, but you shouldn't bank on it not being an issue. Um, you should be getting some traps, some pheromone traps out into the field, monitoring for the corn borer flight. The traps help to catch some of the males um, and eliminating one of the um, sex of the species will reduce breeding. So traps can help you monitor when the pest is coming in, but it can also reduce the number of males. And then once you see that the corn borers are making their way into traps, um, it's really important to start thinking about um, how bad the population is um, and, and what you're gonna do about it. So are you gonna do nothing because the population is low? Are you going to try to spray some type of organic product that's approved, of course? Um, are you gonna release beneficial insects? Um, people are already releasing beneficial wasps, trichogramma wasps. Um, and so I think that's a good idea. We started releasing a couple of weeks ago to um, you know, get the populations as they're coming in. So these are options, but again, something you should be on the lookout for now. Some different photos. This is in corn and in hemp. Okay, these are the traps. You can buy them at a number of different places. Um, it's not just the trap. You have to buy the pheromone that goes into the trap. I know Scott's on the call and John, um, they can uh, answer some questions on that. They can be bought from Gemplers, I think from Arbico Organics, um, but get them out there. Um, don't be surprised when your crop starts, you know, getting infested if you didn't do anything about it, right? Um, and then the trichogramma wasps, same thing. There's a number of places you can get though, get those if that's the direction that you go. We are almost finished with a little fact sheet about this. And so hopefully we'll have that up to provide more guidance. So I wanna um, end on that. It's supposed to be short webinar. I went over a bit and I think we can take some questions and John and Scott, um, you know, please feel free to pipe in as well. So, Heather, we do have a question from the chat about the water requirement. Yes, so the question is about uh, water requirement for full grown plants. Would it be the same for smaller seedlings? Yes, pretty minimal at that point once the plants are, you know, nearing harvest for sure. Yep, and you don't want to overwater them at that time either. It's not really any any purpose to do that and I'm sure some people would say well if they get a little stressed um, you might get the formation of certain cannabidiols. Um, we do know that water stressed plants <laughs> produce higher levels of um, cannabidiols including THC so you don't want to stress them too much. <laughs> uh, and I see Catherine put in our pop-up questionnaire. Uh, so if you can answer that, that would be great. And if you have more questions, please feel free to put those in the chat box or the Q&A box. And yes, we will make the slides available. And if you need any special help, um, again, with soil tests or, or disease identification, insect um, ID or strategies for controlling pests, please reach out. 
Um, again, Scott, myself, John, we're all here to help the best that we can. Catherine, Susie. So Scott and John, I don't know if there's anything you want to add about pests, at, um, pests or, or anything in general that um, I didn't cover or did but wasn't clear about. <laughs> hey, Heather, I'll just add one quick thing is um, if you're, if folks are not able to do the monitoring themselves, depending upon what, uh, for European corn borer that is, sorry, um, depending upon where they are, uh, some states have pretty robust trapping networks um, for sweet corn. And so you can plug into um, like Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, um, New Hampshire, all have their own trapping networks. Um, so you can get an idea for what the, the flight are looking like even if you don't do the trapping yourself. The one caveat is that um, the distribution is not necessarily even across the landscape and so even if you know there's a farm 15-20 miles down the road um, that's trapping uh, that might not be what you're going to see at your location. So yeah that's great that's great information. Um, is there a place that we can share those scouting sites? Yeah, I don't know yeah. them off the top of my head, but I know um, that the link to Pennsylvania and New York, uh, I'll get those um, and try to put those up in the chat now. Great, thank you. Sure. John, anything you wanted to, to add in? Yeah, I guess, so I, I guess I would just add, um, now's a really good time to kind of establish uh, good habits for the upcoming season and really um, get out in the fields, um, regularly uh, check your plants and monitor the fields. Um, also really important um, just to kind of watch out for any potential volunteer seedlings um, and kind of you know, scout those plants, look for males and uh, look for beginning signs of some pest issues or nutrient deficiency, uh, kind of like we talked about a little bit earlier. Because, of course, it's just always better to catch things earlier and um, try to rectify the problem before it becomes a real issue. Thanks, John. That That is great advice. And I always joke that I've never met a plant that people almost love to death. And <laughs> I felt like that happened a little bit last year is that people were you know, they were just, they, they wanted the best, so the best for their plants that they almost loved them too much. Um, and sometimes at the detriment to the plant. And that's why I was kind of showing that picture of the irrigation too, where um, people were really, you know, just wanted to keep giving it everything it needed without always fully understanding what that was. And so um, I know we only had a short time for this webinar and it was a lot of information for people, but again, as Susie mentioned earlier, we're really trying to connect with you as growers um, and service providers uh, so that you so that you know that we're here and that we're that we can help, um, you know, whether it's soil test or trying to ID pests for you. Um, and you know, get everything off to a really good start. We want you to be uh, successful. Great. So I think we're almost at time and uh, the crowd is speechless. So I'm either overwhelmed with way too much information in 30 minutes time. <laughs> or just a lot of food for thought. Either way, I think is maybe good. <laughs> oh, thanks for attending Stephanie as well. Yeah, thank you everyone for taking time out of their day to join us this afternoon. Ah, so we, we do have a little question about a resource for identifying males. Do you guys, do Scott and John, do you know of any resources? We have some good photos. Um, so that's a really good, um, that's something we should get out. John? Yeah, we can, We like you said, we do have some photos. Um, maybe we'll just work on getting that out this week and uh, send it your way. 
so if you are not um, connected to our blog, I think um, we can send that out too, because we generally post these as blogs. Susie's sending them out as well. We send them out through our networks. So hopefully your, your people are getting them. Obviously, if you're on the webinar, you are, so. All right. Well, I'm not gonna hold people up. Um, and I think we all have plenty to do outside, including myself. So anything else, Susie, that you would wanna add before we shut uh, her down? I don't think so. Again, the next webinar is July the 9th that will focus on pests and again, July 30th. And if either of those two dates don't work for you in July, all of the webinars are recorded and will be available on the website. So we'll stay in touch. So keep cool everybody and um, have a good afternoon and thanks for joining us. Thank you.